Well, I think the first lesson that we could take from history trying to understand how the Supreme Court is going to approach an issue as, as big as um, gay marriage is that the Supreme Court really tends not to issue opinions that are strikingly out of the mainstream of where American society is. So many Supreme Court opinions are controversial, but if you look at how they're controversial, they tend not to issue rulings that strong majorities of the American people would necessarily disagree with. So if we just look at some major opinions that the Supreme Court has issued, a lot of them actually are taking national norms, developing national norms, and then applying them to outlier practices, oftentimes to states that somehow are trying to resist a growing consensus in the country. So could you give us some examples? A good example would be something like um, the Griswold case in 1965 in which the Supreme Court first identified a constitutional right to privacy. They struck down a provision, uh, a law in, in Connecticut, which made it illegal to use contraceptives. This is a law which uh, no other states had, which Connecticut was not even enforcing, that they felt there's legally some difficulties. But this is a, a law that was quite controversial because of its implications. But in terms of its direct application, it was something that would be uh, very much in line with where just thinking about this issue most Americans would be. Now, another case that comes up a lot in the gay marriage context would be Brown versus Board of Education. So where are Brown versus Board of Education? And Brown is the famous case in which the Supreme Court held that segregated schools are unconstitutional. Yeah, 1954 case, struck down segregation in schools. Uh, where does this fit in? Because oftentimes people say, well, the Supreme Court has tackled very controversial issues. They have stood up against major sections of the country. So Brown, I think we can look at in a couple different ways. One way is that you need to understand that by 1954, the practice of segregation in schools uh, was uh, an increasingly uh, minority practice within the country. It was just in the South at this point, and even the South is becoming increasingly marginalized with their deep commitment to Jim Crow and segregation. So we do see that by 1954, more and more people in the country uh, were speaking out in favor of civil rights, were criticizing school, desegre school segregation, uh, and therefore the Supreme Court opinion can be seen as uh, partly enforcing this growing norm, this growing national norm on a section of the country that was unwilling to fall in line with where the nation was, was clearly going. So that w might suggest that the court might be willing to find a constitutional right to same-sex marriage because opinion polls tell us that the American people are becoming increasingly supportive of that idea. Yeah, and I think this is key to understanding how historical parallels might inform understanding of what's happening today in the context of gay marriage in the courts, and that is trends. So if you look at trends around, for example, the time of Brown versus Board of Education, it is clear the direction in which this particular issue is moving. The practice of racial segregation in the United States was in decline well before the Supreme Court intervened in 1954. There's still a lot of it left, and there's still many battles to be had. But people who thought about this issue did recognize that this was the direction in which the nation was going. And I think we see the same thing even more clearly in the context of gay marriage, that the poll numbers have been shifting quite dramatically. So anyone who wanted to assess the relative popularity of a potential decision by a Supreme Court recognizing, say, a constitutional right to same-sex marriage would have to read the polls not only for where they are today, in which the nation roughly is about divided 50-50, but also where they have been and where they, uh, it looks like they're going. On the other hand, there is a fairly large group of people who are very much opposed to same-sex marriage. And so what does history tell us about the potential political impact when there is a very strong group of people, perhaps not a majority, but a strong group of people who, who disagree profoundly with a, an opinion? Yeah, so here's another case in which Brown versus Board of Education is usually exhibit A for historians trying to figure out um, how does the nation react to a decision in which there are groups? Again, Brown versus Board of Education was a minority, was dealing with a minority practice at the time. And if you looked at opinion polls at this time of Brown, uh, the nation was probably divided about half and half on the merits of this question of school desegregation. Um, but this is a case in which there was a lot of opposition, and clearly the opposition deeply affected what happened. Uh, now, one thing we want to think about is what would be the avenues for expressing opposition to a particular court opinion, uh, an opinion that would strike down prohibitions on same-sex marriage, uh, 
Uh, there wouldn't be a lot of options, but these options, there would be some out there that would be quite powerful. The most logical one would be a constitutional amendment. Now, one thing that modern United States history shows quite clearly is that it's incredibly difficult to mobilize around, to get a constitutional amendment through. Uh, but clearly, this would be something that uh, I imagine opponents would turn to, the idea of trying to get a constitutional amendment to move forward. Uh, this was, for example, offered, has been offered and continues to be offered uh, by opponents of Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court opinion, recognizing, recognizing constitutional right to an abortion. And Roe versus Wade is, ex is an example of a case in which, arguably, the decision itself helped to galvanize the opposition and, and really strengthen the people who were opposed to abortion rights. Absolutely. So one, uh, another thing that history tells us is that, in general, people who oppose a given Supreme Court decision uh, are able to mobilize more effectively than people who are in support of the given Supreme Court opinion. So, for example, after Brown, it were the segregationists who really uh, created a social movement uh, that um, was energized against Brown. Uh, and they really got to the ground first, uh, and then it was the civil rights movement that would come uh, in full force only a few years later. Uh, so, and Roe versus Wade is another example where uh, there's some argument about exactly what the connection between the strong pro-life movement that has developed in the late 70s and 1980s and Roe versus Wade is, but clearly Roe versus Wade helped energize opponents. And some people would argue it actually did a lot less for energizing supporters of, of uh, Roe versus Wade. So we need to think about possible uh, avenues for mobilization either in support or against a court opinion. If you look at gay rights, um, you could imagine a court opinion that recognizes a constitutional right to same-sex marriage could galvanize opponents in certain ways, or a constitutional decision which says that there is not a constitutional right to gay marriage could mobilize supporters of gay marriage to try and go out and fight uh, for this particular issue. So generally, you do see um, arguing against a court opinion is a better platform for social, or an easier platform for social mobilization than trying to gain more support for a given opinion. But in, in this case, of course, uh, supporters of same-sex marriage are already uh, working pretty hard uh, to, to pass new laws in various states it, to recognize same-sex marriage. And an opinion that says that a state could outlaw gay marriage would not necessarily stop that process. It, it would, in fact, it might, as you're suggesting, make it even stronger. I think that's right. I mean, if you wanted to predict what would happen after a court opinion in which the court refuses to recognize uh, a constitutional right to same-sex marriage, likely it would energize grassroots mobilization, which has been um, achieving a lot on the state level. Uh, it would probably uh, energize them to redouble their efforts on the state level. Uh, but again, looking at the state level as an opportunity to expand the issue, and then probably uh, coming back to the court at some later point, uh, in which the issue would be clarified in a way by achievements on the state level. So the more states that uh, adopt gay marriage, um, the more powerful a platform one would have for going back to the court and saying, look at all these states that have done this. This is a new constitutional norm that we should uh, recognize uh, as a, a, a federal constitutional right. You've talked a lot about Brown versus Board of Education, which is, of course, one of the most important cases of the civil rights movement. Could you talk a little bit about why the civil rights movement seems to loom so large when we think about uh, other social movements, in this case, uh, gay rights? I think that's absolutely right. If you look at the uh, advocates for gay rights, they're constantly trying to connect their movement with the movement for racial equality that happened in the 1950s and 60s. And this has really become an iconic touchstone for people who want to make a claim to constitutional equality to try and connect their particular uh, issue with the issue of racial equality during this period. And then, of course, for those people who are looking to the courts to uh, offer them a, a key breakthrough for their battle, you have Brown versus Board of Education, the most iconic Supreme Court decision, uh, perhaps of all time, certainly of the 20th century. So what you see with the advocates, both in the courts and other courts, they're trying to say that this is the new Brown. This is the issue that they, uh, that is, is the same kind of basic issue, uh, the same kind of basic story about the expansion of American equality that the court recognized in Brown. So you see advocates talking about Brown and the civil rights movement. You see uh, state courts, when they do recognize right to gay marriage on state constitutional grounds, 
they're always referencing the civil rights movement. They're often referencing Brown. And it's pretty sure that uh, when the Supreme Court eventually does recognize a constitutional right to um, same-sex marriage. Which, which, which you think will happen, but perhaps not in this set of cases. It will happen sooner or later. Uh, I think it's unlikely to happen this year. But if you're looking down the road, at some point it's going to happen. At some point this dynamic we talked about earlier, about eventually this practice becoming a very marginalized outlier practice, at some point that's going to happen. And at that point, uh, it's a pretty sure bet that the Supreme Court will step in. Uh, will say that this is going to be a constitutional right. And it's pretty clear that when they do that, they're going to cite quite prominently Brown versus Board of Education and try and make a first effort to creating this opinion whenever it does come as the Brown versus Board of Education of the gay rights movement. Thank you very much, Chris.